Hi there. Today we will be covering the marketing of services and how service is the dominant logic of marketing. From this first slide, you can already see that with services, we include some additional things that aren't really part of the traditional four P's of marketing, right? We have this picture that says the seven P's of marketing. So we add three additional P's, which are people, physical evidence, and process. Now, uh, we are all familiar now, or we should be with the four P's of marketing, product, place, price, and promotion. Well, with people uh, added in there, we start to think about how our customers and our employees and these interactions and relationships between uh, firms and their customers and clients start playing a, a much larger role. We also start thinking about the tangibles and the intangibles of service. So with physical evidence, we could have signage. Uh, we also can think about like the uniforms that our customer service representatives may be wearing. And then also we can think about the process that uh, we have to go through to uh, deliver our services. So just to give you a, uh, uh, an idea of where we're going, we'll move on to how economies have changed and uh, our economy before we uh, really are to where we are where we're at today we started in this agrarian type economy and the basic idea of the agrarian type economy is that you would uh, source your raw material and uh, use that to make a product so we can use a, a cake as an example so those uh, before let's say early 1900s if they wanted to make a cake for uh, their family for their birthday they had to go uh, get the eggs they had to get the butter uh, sugar the flour everything that went into the cake they had to get all of those things uh, separately well uh, in the mid 1900s we started to have the goods based economy uh, for cake and a uh, goods-based economy is where you uh, have a good that could substitute for uh, many of the things that were the raw material. So they would put this together and as a, as a cake mix example, uh, in the beginning of when cake mixes started to become available, they made it to where it was too easy for consumers. All they had to do was add water. Well they realized that uh, consumers wanted it to be a little bit more difficult and this was based off marketing research so what they did was instead of it just being add water they also wanted you to then um, make it to where you had to add eggs as well but with the goods based you have a good or product that is kind of a, a whole package of these raw materials um, in a much more simplified format that you can use and then uh, make your life easier. We next have the, uh, the service economy. And with the service economy, you can think of it as where you previously had to make the, the good or you just <clears throat> purchased a good that uh, you would then transform into something else. Now with the service economy, instead of uh, even having to do that, you can have someone uh, bake the cake for you. So this is where you'd go into a bakery and the cake's already made and uh, you might be able to have it decorated and personalized in a particular manner. So with the service economy, uh, you can have it, personalization is, uh, is stronger because it's not kind of like a mass produced uh, product like we're familiar with in the goods based economy, but service is really a more personalized, tailored approach to products. Now, the last one is the experience economy. And with the experience economy, this is uh, transforming the overall level of service to uh, every encounter with a customer is uh, an, an experience and in the cake example instead of it just being okay you go pick up the the cake from the bakery and you have a, a party off-site this would be where you're actually having a, uh, a full-blown uh, party 
at some event venue, whether it be like, okay, if you remember as a kid, you may have went to like Chuck E. Cheese and had a birthday party, had the cake, had all the different uh, aspects involved in that. So with the experience economy, all of our transactions are experiences for the customers. And we're going to, uh, to get into all of these in a little bit more detail, but there is a great video that I included in your uh, learning module for this week. I encourage you to watch that to have a much deeper dive into each of these uh, concepts. Now, with service dominant logic, it's really important for us to understand this because this um, really solidifies how we can view marketing as a whole, not just services or uh, how we distinguish between products and services, but everything that uh, marketers do is a service. So we'll get into that logic here. So we really had before this idea that we were just exchanging tangible goods. So think about you were exchanging uh, eggs and uh, for money or you were exchanging uh, even the product of the, uh, the cake mix you would exchange that to um, for money. So uh, companies would provide the cake mix or the raw materials, and then a customer would come in and purchase that. Well, now we view it as, okay, what did it take to make that cake mix? There was uh, somebody that had some type of specialized skill that uh, created the, the cake mix, the formula for all the ingredients that go into the cake mix, right? It has to be a very specific amount of each material that is inside that cake mix. Somebody designed that uh, package that the cake mix goes in. Somebody uh, worked with a vendor to get that cake mix put into uh, your local grocery store. And uh, somebody designed the logo on that box. So there's lots of specialized skills and knowledge that uh, we don't really see that go into that one cake mix, right? So that is a great example, but we could apply this to all different types of marketing offerings. Uh, so this could be both in the goods based, which I just gave you an example of cake mix, or we could talk about this in like the services aspect, which would be, uh, okay, like the airlines, for example, or even getting a massage. Uh, those are, are great examples. Uh, a massage is one of the most uh, common examples of a service uh, provision that we could think of or getting a haircut. Um, so with that, there's lots of things involved in both uh, producing that good and getting it to the end consumer, but also uh, in, in services. So goods uh, derive their value through their use. So the service that they provide to the customer. So we can think of this from the cake mix example. Uh, all of the different things that go into that cake mix, that's all the specialized skills, but what a customer gets out of that cake mix, okay, say for example, your mom baked that cake for your birthday and, um, and they, you're really happy because your mom made that cake, but your mom is really happy that, uh, that you're happy and it's, that your birth, it's your birthday and she was able to do something really nice for you. So the service that a cake mix provides both to the uh, end customer, the user, or even the person who, uh, who makes the cake, there's lots of different people that could be involved in who derives value from this particular good. So uh, value is really important. And again here, it's not services dominant, it's service dominant. So uh, we're not talking about all the different services. Uh, service can be uh, through goods. The service dominant logic can be both goods uh, and it could be uh, services. So whenever we're talking about, um, we're talking about the difference between products and services, uh, we just, we're not really going to try to distinguish too much for service dominant logic because all goods, whether they're a product or they're a service, they all have some type of value in use component. And we can all determine uh, the specialized skills, knowledge, and processes that go into whether it be um, the, 
the uh, product or the service. So that's what I really want you to understand is that while uh, while we may think of all these different things that we purchase as a customer, there is really a lot of things that go on behind the scenes to make a final product happen. And there's a lot of things after purchase that a customer really gets value and use from. So that's really the key idea behind service dominant logic. And the key here is that there's some type of application of knowledge and this goes with knowledge based strategy. We talked about this in uh, the era four video for chapter one. And there's often a lot of indirect exchanges. So all those indirect exchanges that determined, OK, the uh, the logo, the packaging, all of those different things, those are indirect exchanges that mask our fundamental basis of exchange. So oftentimes these things aren't transparent and there's usually some type of value co-creation. So uh, both the firm, like if we use the cake mix example, the uh, let's go even at the basic sense, the grocery store gets value in you purchasing that product. You get value in purchasing that product. The uh, manufacturer that sold the product to the grocery store gets some type of value because they are able to then sell more cake mixes in the grocery store. So there's lots of value that is really interactive and involving a lot of different actors. So really service dominant logic is key for us to understanding uh, marketing as it is uh, really something that we can understand at uh, the most fundamental level for how exchange occurs. But there are some fundamental characteristics that we can distinguish between services and goods if we really want to understand the difference a little bit better. So <clears throat> we'll go through each of these. We have uh, these come from your textbook. It's really nice. I think they have a nice table that helps us distinguish these. Uh, intangibility is really one of the key things that are part of services. Um, and with services, Oftentimes, there's nothing that you take back with you, right? Uh, from a massage, you feel good, or from your haircut, usually you have your hair at the end of it, but there's really no uh, tangibility that comes from that. But with goods, we have something tangible that we can take uh, with us because it's like the cake mix. You can take it, you see it, and you get something tangible from it. Now, there is uh, inseparability where uh, services cannot be separated from the person providing it or the firm providing it. So uh, the service, like us sitting at the, uh, on an airplane, um, there's someone that's driving that airplane, right? Flying the airplane for us. Now, without that pilot, we would probably crash. So uh, without the pilot, then the service wouldn't be able to be performed. So with, uh, with goods, Goods can be produced by one individual and sold by another individual. And that goes back to what we talked about in uh, era one <clears throat> video, era two video. We talked about how goods are made by manufacturer. They're sold by, um, they're sold to a wholesaler and then a wholesaler even sells it to the end retailer uh, to get to the end consumer. So uh, that is one key difference. We also have perishability associated with um, with services. So if you think about this from like a hotel standpoint or even a air, airline standpoint with services, the perishability is like, OK, if a hotel does not sell a room for tonight in Lubbock, um, they're never going to be able to get that room rate back ever again the profit that they would have made off of that room uh, they've lost that forever because we have a um, a finite time that we can actually uh, sell a service to that customer same thing with airlines if they don't sell a seat on the airplane for that particular day time then they're never going to be able to recover that one particular profit off that one seat uh, but with goods Oftentimes, um, 
we have we obviously have some perishable goods like you can think about milk is one bread because they can go bad but many of the products that we purchase like our iphone um technology products anything that really isn't a, a food-based good then uh, we can have those forever uh, in retrospect as long as we take care of them right so there's high perishability associated with services there's also a stronger relationship that's much more long term in a services type exchange rather than the goods goods are often impersonal um, shorter relationships but um, the strength and duration of these good space relationships can be can be pretty strong also but uh, the client relationship for services is much stronger and much more long term you can think about this if you've been going to the same person you've gotten your haircut from from a long time or even your dentist um, that's really signifies a great example of how a client relationship exists in those particular service industries we also have a much more uh, higher level of involvement from the customer with services and that's because like okay let's use your haircut as an example you can really specify and tailor what you would like uh, from your uh, experience so from that service you can say I want my hair cut in this way I want my hair colored in this way uh, can you do this can you do that um, even with like a massage or any type of service you can get it customized to really fit your specific needs now with the product you're pretty limited as a customer because you get what is available sometimes um, you can get more customized products and we'll talk about those in future chapters in new product development but uh, oftentimes this customization is uh, a lot less likely and finally with uniformity um, services there's a lot uh, a lot less uniformity in what occurs so you and your friend may go to the same hairstylist uh, at one point in time and you may get different levels of quality you may feel like uh, your you may feel like the quality is either higher or lower than your friend feels but with uh, with goods typically because a lot of these goods are mass produced you get the same level of quality uh, regardless if you're buying the cake mix in uh, in New Mexico or you're buying that same cake mix up in uh, New Hampshire so the goods are much more uniform in their quality and their standards uh, across geographic locations and uh, usually across the um, places that you buy them so we can talk a little bit about service quality because that's really important for services there's some key components that go into service quality one being uh, the tangible so uh, a lot of times service companies try to provide some physical evidence of that service that way they can enhance their service quality there's also the aspect of reliability so every time you go in to get your hair cut you want to have some consistency of what type of service you're going to get so that reliability is really key and then with responsiveness you have to see that um, whenever you call that they're for your your hair appointment or the service that you're you're trying to get that they're going to be willing and ready to provide that service to you uh, and not just say oh yeah we're you know we're going to have to wait another month because we're just too busy right now so it's kind of like the responsiveness makes you feel important and that leads to a higher quality you also have to have the assurance that they're going to um, you can trust and be confident in the service that they're providing to you uh, so you wouldn't go to the uh, like your hairstylist uh, if you didn't trust that they're going to uh, fix your hair in a way that is going to be uh, competent you know that they're they're not going to mess up your hair uh, or like if you went to a massage therapist that you're not going to leave there feeling worse than what you did going uh, this could be the same with a chiropractor or even a dentist like if you go to the dentist you 
have to feel confident and trust them that they're going to uh, clean your teeth in, a, in an appropriate way and you're not going to leave there with some type of uh, issue that, um, that could occur if you went to somebody who wasn't reputable. And then finally, service providers, if they have a higher level of empathy towards their customer, then they will feel like, the customer will feel like that they have a higher level of service quality that they're providing. And uh, one of the last things that we'll be covering is internal marketing. And internal marketing is, um, is a way that companies can uh, really encourage their employees to offer better service to customers. One is through the selection of their frontline employees. And frontline employees are basically anybody that a customer would interact with uh, in a retail store location, even um, on the on the phone, whenever you call the uh, customer service hotline, that um, that's who the customer would interact with. So carefully selecting those who uh, who would be best fit for that job is really important. Uh, also, offering a clear, concrete message to employees about your uh, level of service and the expectations that you have as a firm. Um, modeling by managers. So with this, managers model the desired behavior that they would like their employees to exhibit. And also encouraging an energetic follow through process and actually from a company standpoint, following through with those expectations and guidelines, both by managers, uh, but also um, rewarding those at lower levels for following through on these uh, initiatives. And finally, the whole basic idea is uh, without a good attitude, the service providers aren't really going to uh, get good ratings. So the key here is attitude is everything, right? We've heard that saying before, and that is pretty key for, uh, for services and customer service and service quality. So emphasizing those good attitudes is really important from a uh, company standpoint for their employees. The last thing we'll talk about today are challenges to the marketing of services. The first challenge is developing new services. Uh, this is pretty evident in the fact that if you've gone to the same hairstylist or um, to get a massage or a nail salon, they oftentimes struggle with offering new types of services. And this can be due to the fact that sometimes that requires additional licensing. Um, it's hard to innovate in some of these service arenas like airlines they really struggle with offering new services because um, you know your most basic idea with the airline is that you're getting a seat and they're transporting you from a to b but what they offer in between is kind of the service experience so it's really been difficult for them to offer new types of services to attract uh, different types of customers uh, it's also very difficult for firms to improve their service quality. How they distribute their services is very difficult to change also, where a, uh, a ind because individuals are playing a key role in how services are distributed, uh, oftentimes they're locked to a certain location, like your hairstylist is usually locked to wherever they perform their services at. Same thing goes for uh, like a massage therapist or a dentist. They're not going to oftentimes come to your house, right? That I've never seen a dentist, a traveling dentist that goes around to people's houses and performs uh, the dental exam and the cleaning. So it's very difficult for them to, uh, to distribute their services in a different way. Underlying all of these things is how these uh, service providers are able to adapt to meet customer needs and wants. Oftentimes, it's very difficult for, as individuals, you may be familiar with this just on an individual level, that it's very difficult to change. And uh, adapting to, uh, to the changes and customers' needs and wants is very difficult. Uh, a lot of service providers struggled with this even during COVID-19. 
So adapting to meet customer needs, while it's really important, it's very challenging for service providers. And finally, one of the last challenges for service providers is uh, how they can tangibly represent their service to customers. And um, with tangibles, it's really great to have those things, but it's really difficult to determine, okay, what's the best way that we can offer some tangible evidence or some tangible uh, aspect of our service to our clients during, uh, during their experience, but also maybe something they can take with them after their experience. So that really concludes our lesson on uh, marketing of services and the service dominant logic. If you have questions about this chapter, please feel free to email me at kt.manus at ttu.edu. Thank you.